a recent five-year period, 75 million Americans changed homes, uprooting parents and children from family, church, and community. That's a sizable part of the entire population. We become an extraordinarily restless people. We move from place to place, job to job, relationship to relationship, at an ever-increasing rate. What is it that we're looking for? It is written. This is George Vanderman presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today, restlessness and the rock. Restlessness. We are an uprooted culture in more ways than one. Some have called our time the age of anxiety. Why? Psychologists usually point to things like rush sickness, our tendency to try to cram 30 hours of activity into a 24-hour day. And then there's something called straining, the attempt by those who think they aren't getting ahead fast enough to strain harder for promotion or for social approval. And of course, our incredible mobility is often seen as the culprit. But don't such things seem more like symptoms than sources of our anxiety? The point is, why are we cramming? Why are we straining? Why are we always on the move? Some observers looking on the contemporary scene have concluded that we're experiencing a stress epidemic. It was recently reported that two-thirds of the people who visit family doctors, two-thirds, come with stress-related symptoms and medical expenses, lost productivity resulting from stress-related factors have been estimated to cost us from 50 to 75 billion dollars a year. Incredible. Stress is a big problem, and everyone points to our high-pressure, fast-paced lifestyle as the culprit. No doubt that's a factor. But has anyone stopped to consider this? What kind of stresses did our parents and grandparents endure during the supposedly good old days? Do you think it was easy for a man to watch his farm waste away in the Dust Bowl during the Great Depression? Do you think it was easy to live through six years of a world at war? Of course not. There were enormous stresses then, as there are in every time. Why then is ours the age of anxiety? Something more than a hurried lifestyle, I believe, is involved. There's something important missing at the center of our lives. Usually, when our hectic schedule becomes too much for us, we flee to some spot of tranquility, say a beautiful, quiet island in the South Pacific. Sounds peaceful, doesn't it? Well, consider Micronesia, with its image of smiling, barefoot people fishing and playing all day. Do you know what the number one cause of death is there? Suicide, my friend. Yes, suicide. It's become an epidemic among young men there. The suicide rate for young males in Micronesia is 20 times higher than that in the United States. Observers theorize that there aren't enough challenges on the islands. People grow soft and fall apart under any misfortune. We are restless. We can run, but we can't hide. What is it that we're looking for? What is it that we need to find? Why are we so helpless before stress and depression and anxiety, my friend? Well, it's about time we looked at something deeper than the symptoms. Don't you think so? I'd like to start by showing you a prime example of our restlessness and instability. A man who lived some time ago. His name was George Mueller. At first, let me tell you about our gift book for today. It's also an attempt to get beyond the symptoms, disarming depression. You'll find a great deal of practical help in these pages for problems like depression, false guilt, anxiety. You'll find solutions that relate to the center of our lives. So please be sure to call or write for the free book, Disarming 
depression. Now to George Mueller, the picture of instability. He started out very early in the wrong direction. Before the age of 10, he began stealing from his father. When he was caught and punished, he simply determined to steal more cleverly the next time. In fact, on the day before his confirmation, George even stole part of the money he was supposed to give the pastor, who had been instructing him about the virtues of the Christian life. As a youth, Mueller continued a very aimless, self-indulgent lifestyle. Once it even landed him in debtor's prison. This young man was going nowhere fast. Many times he resolved to improve, but quickly slipped back into a well-worn rut of irresponsibility. His promises were like ropes of sand. While attending the university, he drank, wasted his money, pawned his belongings. He borrowed extensively and drank, of course, more. George Mueller didn't have anything to live for. He didn't seem capable of living for anything but the next great thrill. But... Let's look at this man a few years later. We wouldn't be able to recognize him. He had become George Mueller, founder of the orphanages in Victorian England. Mueller acted as father and provider to thousands of orphans. Calmly, consistently, faithfully over a 63-year period. And what is especially remarkable about Mueller's enterprises is that his orphanages were entirely supported by donations. And George Mueller accomplished all of this without ever once asking a soul for a penny, without ever making any of his needs known. This man had embarked on his enterprise as a grand experiment. He wanted something, as he put it, that would act as a visible proof that our God and Father is the same faithful God as ever he was to all who put their trust in him. During Mueller's career, he received nearly 1,500,000 British pounds for his work. And you remember what a pound was worth then. And he cared for some 10,000 children and built several orphanages. It was quite an undertaking. 2,000 children to be fed every day, their clothes washed and repaired, five large buildings to be kept up, matrons, overseers, nurses, and teachers to be paid. And according to Mueller, over those six decades, God never missed a step. No child ever went without a meal or had a moment's anxiety, and no baker or milkman ever settled for an IOU. Mueller's calm faith never wavered. When some calamity threatened, he never panicked waited patiently for the faithful one to come through. What an incredible difference from the youth who drank his way through college and who couldn't even be trusted with an offering for the church pastor. What had happened? George Mueller, the picture of instability, had run into God, the everlasting rock. He'd found a stable center for his life. Well, while still a young man, Mueller began studying the Bible and discovered that God loved the world so much he'd given up his son. Mueller was won over by the love of Christ. His life radically changed. As he put it, what all the exhortations and precepts of my father and others could not affect, what all of my own resolutions could not bring about, even to renounce a life of sin and rebellion, I was unable to do and able to do, constrained by the love of Jesus. The unstable can grab hold of God and discover a solid rock, my friend. The spiritually and emotionally restless can find a home. This is what we need in our age of anxiety and instability. This is the answer for our restlessness. We need to find a center. We need to grab hold of the solid rock. Scripture repeatedly describes him as the strong tower, a shield for those who take refuge in him. Listen to how the psalmist celebrates God as a source of security. Psalm 18, verse 2, the New International Version says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I will take refuge. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation my stronghold. God gives people stability 
in an unstable world because he is, the ever, he is everlastingly changeless. God doesn't get up on the wrong side of the bed in the morning. He doesn't get bent out of shape. He's not up and down. The rock of ages is dependable, faithful to a thousand generations. He's not relative. He doesn't bend with the time or flow with the current. God is perfect just the way he is, was, and shall be. Oh, friend, he doesn't need to update himself. He's absolute, one indivisible being, an eternal living rock to our endless anxious motion. What God says is frozen, <laughs> forever true. People sliding and slipping their way through life have found a word to be a sure foothold, carved in granite. So often we're trapped in a constant flux that makes us stagger through life. But encountering the rock, we run into a still spot. With this God, the restlessness can stop. We discover an immovable place of rest. The rock of ages enables people to stand firm. And one of the reasons they do so is something called peace. Peace. Now, we may not think much of that word at first. In fact, it may suggest to some a rather boring tranquility. But stop and think about it, friend. Isn't the absence of peace in the heart our problem today? We try to cope with stress. We try to deal with depression and anxiety. We try to adopt the right lifestyle. And we go on and on, coping and trying and searching, never seeming to find a center, never finding a rock to hold on to, never finding peace. That's what we're all looking for, every one of us. God's peace is a profound sense of well-being, belonging. It's finding the soul's home, a contentment that lasts. It's something that fills you up. This is exactly what almost every human being on this planet is running after, happiness and peace. And where's the only place we can find it? At that great source of stability, my friend, that rock of ages, the God of Scripture. God is a rock, steady, supremely at peace. Tranquility flows out of that eternal one. It's part of him. It's been flowing for some time. The changeless, consistent God has been bestowing this priceless quality on all kinds of people over the years. Let me give you a picture of peace down through the ages. We'll start in the town of Bethlehem, about 1000 BC. David, son of Jesse, grew up there dodging danger. He had to fight with wild beasts to protect his sheep. And later, he had to endure life as a fugitive for many years before his calling to the throne became a reality. But listen to what this man wrote. Psalm 23, verses 1 to 4, the New International Verse Version says this, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Very familiar words, but think of what they mean. Coming from a man who went through so many struggles, David found a God who could bestow real peace. Now let's speed on to the city of Jerusalem. The year is 750 BC. At this time, mighty Assyria was threatening tiny Israel with total destruction. But in the midst of this terror, the prophet Isaiah discovered that the Lord is the rock eternal. He had the confidence to proclaim this, recorded in the 26th chapter of his book, book verse 3. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Isaiah shows us perfect peace in what should have been a time of trouble and anxiety. Now we move to the town of Ephesus. In 54 AD, the Apostle Paul was writing from prison to friends in Philippi who were very anxious about his condition, but he never mentioned the pain of his confinement or the harshness of his Roman guards. Instead, his letter flowed with encouragement and joy. 
He could recommend to the Philippians the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. This man lived on the road, fleeing murderous fanatics, battling heresies, carving out islands of Christian belief in a rough sea of paganism, shipwrecked, falsely accused, mobbed, beaten, whipped, stoned, constantly in danger. He should have been completely stressed out. Instead, he calmly handed out peace from prison. Listen to this priceless message from Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 12 and 13. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Priceless. Through him who gives me strength. That's the source. Now we can move ahead to October of 1735 and into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. A storm struck a sailing vessel midway between England and the colonies. The wind blew with a determined fury. The boat rocked its passengers into a state of panic. Even the seasoned crew feared for their lives. One of the passengers huddled below death, deck in terror was John Wesley. But glancing over to a group of Mon Moravian believers, he was shocked to see them calmly singing a hymn. And the more wildly the ship was tossed about, the more calmly these Germans sang praises. Wesley was trying to practice the Christian life at the time, but he realized these people had discovered a peace that was still foreign to him. He wanted to find out what enabled them to proceed through a sail-ripping, skin-drenching storm without missing a beat. So after the storm subsided, a deeply shaken Wesley struck up a conversation with a Moravian pastor. After a bit, the pastor asked him, Do you know Jesus Christ? Wesley replied, I know that he's the savior of the world. True, but do you know that he has saved you? Obviously, the Moravians had this knowledge, this still spot of assurance. They'd come close to the eternal God, and his peace had enveloped them. It was a peace so remarkable that it moved John Wesley to a more intense spiritual quest of his own, and eventually to a religious revolution in England. The final scene of our search today takes place in Beaver, Marsh, Oregon. It's Thanksgiving Day, 1961. Merrill Womack, a gospel singer and businessman, was taking off in a light plane for a small private airport during freezing weather. He didn't quite clear the trees at the end of the runway. His plane whipped around and plunged a hundred yards through icy branches to the ground. When Womack remained, regained consciousness, he saw flames all around him. Before he could scramble out, his arms, legs, chest, and head were badly burned. Womack couldn't see, but he stumbled through the deep snow toward the sounds of a nearby highway. Fortunately, two men saw the plane go down and rushed to the scene in a station wagon. Womack looked terrible, no eyes, nose, or mouth. His head was charred and swollen. The men placed him gently in the back of the car and drove off toward a hospital. They picked me up and put me in the back seat of their automobile and started me on the way to the hospital. You know how I must have felt at that time. Here I, my face was completely burned, my hands were burned, and I reached up and opened up one eye so I could see the skin on the back of my hands, and, and then I laid down in the back seat of the car. Instead of desiring, you know, feeling like crying out in pain, as would be the normal thing, I all of a sudden felt like singing. And I sang all the way to the hospital and all the time that the doctor wrapped my hands. The next day when my wife came to see me, the doctor made a statement to her, said that, you know, Mrs. Womack, we lose more patience from the shock that accompanies a burn like this than the burn itself, yet your husband didn't have even the slightest bit of shock. It must have been the song that he was singing. That song was so important. And I've come to regard it as one of my favorites. It goes like this. I found a sweet savior, and now I'm made whole. I'm pardoned and have my release. His spirit abiding and blessing my soul. Praise God. In my heart there is peace. Well, at Collier State Park, an ambulance met the station wagon. The attendants transferred Merrill on a stretcher and raced away. He heard the piercing scream of the siren. It seemed to echo his own terrible pain. 
But still the song emerged unchanged, a tune with eternal meaning. Wonderful peace, wonderful peace, peace that the world cannot give. When I think how he brought me from darkness to life, there is wonderful, wonderful peace. Oh, friends, the rock of ages can give you this kind of peace. It's a priceless quality to have in our world. We need so desperately to find a center for our lives. We can find it in the rock, Jesus. Have you found the Savior? Have you found pardon and release? Have you been made whole? Start today. Take the first step that will lead you to peace of heart and mind. Take hold of the rock of ages. Place your faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord. Just now, as we listen to Marilyn Cotton sing about the cornerstone, our rock of ages. Jesus is the cornerstone, came for sinners to atone. Though rejected by his own, he became the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone. When I am by sin oppressed, on the stone I am at rest. When the sea is the cornerstone. Rock of ages left for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Rock of ages Thank you, Marilyn, for that medley of peace. Shall we pray? Father mine, we praise you, the rock of ages, for making peace possible on this restless planet. You've worked wonderfully down through the ages, creating joy and tranquility in the midst of so much fear and so much confusion. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you above all for the gift of Jesus and his gift on the cross. You offer us forgiveness and reconciliation. We need it. We accept it. We want to center our lives on the solid rock. Confirm our faith in you now as Savior and Lord, as Prince of Peace, in his name. Amen. Here's a book that I'd like to send you that ties in helpfully with what we've discussed together here today, Disarming Depression. Disarming Depression shares good news about God's plans, His very personal, specific plans to bring real happiness and peace of mind into your life. There's a chapter entitled Handling False Guilt. 
It's a topic we've talked about before here on It Is Written. Another intriguing title, The Gandhi Mystique. I won't give that one away. You'll have to read it for yourself. And there's so much more included that I know you'll want to have as well. No charge at all for this book. So please feel free to ask for your copy to read and then share with a good friend. Remember, it's Disarming Depression and it's yours for the asking. Now here is the information you need. As a convenience, you may request today's free gift offer, Disarming Depression, by calling our toll-free number 1-800-253-3000. Call right now. That's 1-800-253-3000. Remember, the offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the offer, Disarming Depression. Call toll-free now, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open 24 hours daily. If you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Now, you know that I believe in the principles that are in this book, Disarming Depression. I believe that they're deeply needed by people everywhere. The principles involved we need to share with our friends and loved ones because there are so many people that are plagued by depression. However, in addition to this, may I say before we close our program, one other great source of strength is prayer. And it is written as a prayer ministry. We also believe in a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. We believe in a compassionate God who loves us more than we'll ever be able to understand. And so, let me urge you to send in your prayer requests. We want to hear them, we want to present them to God, and we want you to trust Him with us. But now the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Thank you.